Okay, hello everyone. Hi, uh, welcome. Before we start, I'm going to obviously enjoy your lunches. There may be a couple of students still filtering in from classes, but because we have a full schedule, we want to uh, get going. And before I introduce our guests, I want to tell you a little bit about, about the event uh, so that you have a little bit of a context of what we're trying to accomplish here. And I think it's really fantastic. I mean, the name is a bit of a mouthful. Assessing Regulatory Instruments of Behavioral Change, Lessons from Household Energy Conservation. But uh, really, um, before I talk about that, let me just um, alert the students here. It's very unusual to get such a great group of people, not only from other law schools, but also across many different disciplines uh, that we have here, economics, public policy, psychology, and of course, a uh, law to talk about such an important issue. And to understand why it's important, I'm sure you all understand the, the significance of the whole issue of energy conservation. But from my perspective, although we will focus on that, the goal is not just to learn about this area, but to really draw broader lessons because increasingly, both in the US and around the globe, governments and other organizations are using behavioral instruments more and more to try to shape how citizens, how people act in various domains of life. Now, this is all is partly the fault of the lawyers, as usual. It started um, a little while back uh, with an obscurely titled article that you can't even see. It's a bit small there. Libertarian paternalism is not an oxymoron. An article by Cass Sunstein that we know, Dick Taylor. Um, and that article did not uh, get much attention outside of a few people like me and maybe some other legal scholars who were attuned to this area. Nobody really cared about that. I guess the law review editors did. But outside of the University of Chicago law review editors and, and a few of us, nobody really paid attention. Um, but a few years later, about five years later, the first edition of the book Nod that really kind of entered public discourse and elite conversations and caught the attention of policymakers everywhere. Uh, this was really the nudge that made uh, made it move on on the policy side. And the just to go fast forward because I don't have a lot of time for that. Um, the supposed final edition after a few uh, additional ones in the middle from uh, the summer of 2021, uh, after selling a few million copies uh, offline, online, uh, really sort of caps it all. And if you look at the hype at the front of the final edition from Dan Kahneman, who just passed away, another Nobel Prize winner, um, few books can be said to have changed the world, but Nudge did. Now, I admit it's cover height, but it's not completely baseless. If you look at this map, which you can't possibly read, the impression is to see how many like dots you have with. This is from the OECD Behavioral Insights team or segment, and this is from about five years ago, so it understates the case. And it's just a mapping of different governments and different organizations from the World Bank to OECD and so forth, and other units elsewhere who use behavioral insights to try to shape what people do in society. On a relatively recent estimate, there are probably about 900 organizations that self-identify as behavioral or behavioral driven. They could be units of government, local or state or national or supranational level, they could be consulting outsets that focus on behavioral stuff and provide their services to government. And this is happening in every area. By this point, there have been probably tens of thousands of these interventions from economic development to health and safety and finance, personal finance and savings to regulation and other areas and tax and so on and so forth. I mean, you all probably encountered it very, very 
Um, personally, during the COVID pandemic, we've seen a whole lot of different kinds of campaigns and interventions to try to get people to do everything from staying at home to uh, to covering their, to masking their faces, to vaccinating, to keeping social distancing, and so on and so forth. So the notion that we use psychological or behavioral uh, methods to try to shape what people do as opposed to just relying on the traditional toolkit that we have in law and regulation, namely mandates and bans, taxes and subsidies, and so forth, kind of expanding that arsenal has become very, very common in uh, public policy around the globe and in the US as well. So I just wanted to have this context. We will be talking, um, and the presentation will be primarily about household energy conservation because this is a major policy area. It's an area where people like, uh, actually some of the people sitting here, like Professor Runner Bear have been uh, talking and doing and other uh, behavioral stuff before there was a nudge thing. Um, and there are many, many examples, as we will hear from our first speaker, of these types of interventions. So it's a great place, both because of its significance and because of the pervasiveness of behavioral interventions in this area for us to kind of use it both for its own purpose and to serve as a case study. And we'll try maybe if we have time in the round table, at least in order to back end, to see if we can draw some broader lessons. And if we don't, that's basically whatever we hear here might have substantial relevance for other areas of law, regulation, and policy, even if we don't have time to tease it out fully because of our constraints. So without further ado, let me just uh, introduce our speakers and our commentators, a really a terrific group. And the way we're gonna do this is basically I'll introduce them and then um, I'll invite our first speaker to go and they'll go in a sequence because of the number of people who won't stop for like Q and A after each presentation, basically run them in a sequence, have our commentator, have a little coffee break. And then in a round table, we'll kind of rehash some of the agreements, disagreements, unaddressed questions and so on and so forth. Okay, without further ado, and I'm just doing it alphabetically, it's not, not indicating anybody uh, more or less significant. Uh, our first person is uh, um, Dmitry uh, Tobinsky. He's an associate professor, um, tenured associate professor of economics at UC Berkeley, and a research associate at NBER. For those who don't know, this is kind of the primary economic research sort of clearinghouse or outfit that we have uh, in the US. Uh, Professor Talbinski applies uh, insights from behavioral economics to questions about public policy using both theory, surveys, experiments, and, and so on, and, and observational data like economists often do. His wide range of publications uh, are across many leading economic journals. I'm not going to go into that. Just to illustrate for you the kind of work that he does, he studies topics uh, like people's inattention to not fully salient taxes understanding or misunderstanding of tax incentives, uh, energy policy for consumers who do not pay attention to energy costs of durables, what we call uh, sin taxes on things like sugary drinks, you'll hear about those a bit today perhaps, um, welfare effects of social recognition and so on and so forth. So really a wide range of things and you can understand why I asked Professor Tobinski to join us. He has a PhD in economics from Harvard, and before that, he also had a BA in applied math um, as well from Harvard University. Uh, Professor uh, Michael Vanderberg, who's uh, one of the other lawyers in the mix, but much more than just a simple lawyer, a very, a very, a very distinguished one. Uh, he's the David Daniels Allen Distinguished Chair in Law. Um, at Vanderbilt uh, Law School. He's also the director of the Climate Change Research Network and co-director of the Energy, Environment, and Land Use Program there. Um, he is really one of those uh, rare examples of law professors who do truly interdisciplinary work, and which is a word you hear bandied about a lot, but not executed very often. Um, and whose publications are not just in law reviews, but really in peer-reviewed journals across all the relevant uh, discipline. And I think that is makes him a very valuable um, 
part of this conversation. His research focuses uh, specifically on how to work interdisciplinary teams to explore environmental governance, environmental behavior, and climate change. Um, and his interdisciplinary work uh, really um, focuses on reduction of carbon emissions from the household sector, which is exactly the kind of work we'll be talking about today. Um, and he is a very highly uh, cited scholar with numerous books, countless articles, um, really no need to get into all that. What might be interesting for, for you as a legal audience is before joining uh, the law faculty at Vanderbilt, uh, Professor Vanderbilt um, was a partner at Latham & Watkins in DC. He served as chief of staff of the EPA from 93 to 95 and began his career as a law clerk for Judge uh, Becker of the uh, Third Circuit, who, a long-standing judge there who passed away almost 20 years ago, but, uh, but was a major, a major judge on that circuit. So he really brings a very wide uh, range of experiences and perspectives. He also conducted my wedding, which I think is a wonderful <laughs> That's all we need to say. Um, and, and the final of our main speakers is uh, Professor Kim Wolski. She is a research associate professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy and a fellow of the Energy Institute at the University of Chicago. Um, her work draws on environmental, social, and cognitive psychology to examine the behavioral dimensions of energy issues with an eye towards how to design better kind of the public facing policies and programs that are employed in this area. Just to give you some concrete examples of the kind of uh, work that she's done in recent years is um, in collaboration with various uh, institutes and as part of the Department of Energy uh, Initiative is investigating strategy for lowering the, what she calls the soft costs of installing residential rooftop solar uh, panels. That's one example. Other research talking about different ways of framing climate change solution and how they can influence public perceptions uh, in this area and so on and so forth. Her uh, BA is uh, from Connecticut College in Environmental Studies, Master's in Natural Resources Policy and Behavior, um, from UMich, and then a PhD in environmental psychology, also uh, from the University of Michigan. And finally, uh, our two uh, commentators, uh, we have uh, our very own Professor uh, Bruce Huber, who needs very little introduction here, but just for, for parity, we should say a little bit, right? Uh, a scholar of environmental law, natural resource law, property, energy law, um, and his particular expertise focuses on energy regulation, public land and resource management, and the interaction between law and politics. Is, is there an interaction between law and politics? I didn't know that. Um, anyway, his scholarship in these fields um, uh, really has been published in, in many leading law reviews. He's been with us uh, since 2011 here at Notre Dame Law School, an undergraduate degree at Stanford, a JD and PhD in political science uh, from UC Berkeley. Um, and again, what may be interesting for those who do not know that not only before uh, joining Notre Dame, uh, Professor Huber taught for several years um, at Dartmouth College in the Department of Government, but he also practiced law in Washington State and worked as a college minister for a large Presbyterian church. The, and, and, you know, as many of you have already awarded him kind of distinguished teacher of the year and so forth, I don't need to say much more. And our last but not least is, is Professor Jonathan Click um, from UPenn. He's a Charles A. Uh, Heimbold Professor of Law there. And he focuses, he's really a leader uh, in empirical legal studies, as if you want a subfield within law and economics, although now it's most of law and economics, uh, empirical uh, legal studies. And he really focuses on identifying the causal effects of laws and regulations on individual behavior using uh, various econometric tools specific topics, and you'll see that he has an eye towards the boring type of things that people may think of. For example, the relationship between abortion access and risky sex, the effect of police on crime, addiction as rational choice, how liability exposure affects labor market for physicians, and I could go on, but you get the drift. Um, his scholarship has been published again in leading law reviews and uh, peer-reviewed journals in law and economics and economics. 
Um, he is a George Mason JD and PhD in economics. And before then, he had a master's economics in Maryland and a bachelor of economics from Villanova. So this is our uh, set of panelists. And without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Wolski, our first uh, speaker, to the podium. And basically, we'll, as I said, we'll have them uh, sort of sequentially in the interest of time. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Just a second. So uh, thank you, and thank you for the introduction. Um, my goal here is to kind of help set the stage of how we can think about using behavioral science and energy policy and why it's beneficial. So a lot of current climate policy is focused on the clean energy transition, this idea that we need to shift away from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources or zero carbon uh, energy sources like nuclear. And to complement that, we need electrification. We need to move away from internal combustion vehicles and move away from heating oil and other fossil fuel-based sources. Um, which means that there is a role for households. You can see in this chart uh, the effect of greening the grid with and without getting households to electrify their homes and their transportation choices. What that means, um, they could actually help green the grid by putting solar on their homes, but they could switch to an electric vehicle. Uh, there's a big push in the Northeast to help people get off of heating oil and to um, heat pump for heating and cooling. There's heat pump water heaters. There's also a role still for typical home retrofits because that allows us to use this energy more efficiently. And there's a role for what we call demand side management, helping people not only conserve energy, but we need to think about when in the day they are using energy. So renewable sources like wind and solar have an intermittency problem. The sun does not always shine. It's not always windy. And it means we can overgenerate -gener energy at certain times of the day and not have that renewable source at others. So we need to encourage people to shift when in the day they're doing things like running the laundry or the dishwasher. So there's the potential here for a win-win in that many of these behaviors can be beneficial to people and align with goals they already have. So Dr. Tor used the phrase, nudges are often used to shape people's behavior. I take a bit of a broader view of the role of behavioral science of how can we use it to help people meet the goals that they already have. So for some people, that is how do I lower my energy cost? For others, they have old drafty homes. It's how do I make my home healthier and more comfortable? And we can also have higher order goals that these actions can contribute to, like environmental stewardship or for example, in Orange County, California, a lot of people who have solar, it's out of a motivation for self-sufficiency and not being as reliant on the utility. So there's this potential for a win-win, but there is a challenge psychologically that people have a lot of goals and they differ temporally, that we tend to be present biased and we tend to think about, many of you are thinking about assignments you have to do for later this week or next week. And then there are long-term goals. And because of that present bias, we don't always think or activate those longer-term goals and don't always act in ways that help us achieve them. So behavioral science can help make these, can help activate these goals for people um, to, so that these types of goals are part of their decision-making. And to understand how that's possible, I'm gonna walk you through some of the challenges of people making energy efficient choices or shifting towards electrification, why it's challenging given what we know about the limits of human cognition. We have limited attention, we can only think about so much at once, and a lot of things kind of fall to the wayside. And then I'll just talk through at a high level some of the behavioral interventions that have been used in this space and explain why they can be helpful um, in helping people achieve these behaviors. So 
One of the biggest challenges for people is that energy is out of sight and out of mind. It is not something that we experience even as much as water flowing out of a tap. You take for granted that electricity is powering the goods in your home, that you're getting heating and cooling. And a lot of our behaviors are habitual, which means that we're sort of on autopilot. We're not really thinking about how we use energy in a, on a day-to-day -day basis. What this means, because we don't directly experience our consumption of energy, there's numerous studies showing people really don't understand the relative energy consumption of different actions that they take. And they don't have a lot of information to guide them. At best, for many people, there is just a monthly energy bill. And if you have yours on auto pay, you don't even look at that. This energy bill aggregates your consumption. And there's this great analogy from research back in the 80s. Imagine you had gone into a grocery store for the first time in your life, and there were no prices on anything. And you check out, and you're just told the total amount. Now you want to figure out how to save money, and you have no idea how much the different items cost. You would start making guesses. Well, this bag of flour is kind of heavy. Maybe it's more expensive than this salmon. You can see that there's this potential for errors. And that's what happens in the energy space as well. People have faulty mental models of how energy works. So a lot of people think that a thermostat is like putting your foot on the accelerator in a car, that the more you crank it up, the faster it'll heat up. That is not how it works. And there's a, a bias called availability bias where things that are really salient to you, you will deem to be more important or more common. And we have seen this in various studies that if you ask people what they can do to conserve energy, they will overestimate the benefit of the things they see themselves doing often, like turning off the lights, or they'll even think that recycling helps make a big dent in addressing climate change. The flip side of this is that they underestimate the impact of bigger actions. So that 45 degree line is showing what the energy consumption is of these different devices. This is research from Shazin Atari at IU. People were asked to estimate how much energy do these different devices use. And as a reference point, she reminded them that a traditional incandescent light bulb uses 100 kilowatts, kilowatt hours you can see there's compression and that people are not seeing how much more energy things like a clothes dryer or an air conditioner use from say a laptop or a desktop. What this means is that when people are looking for ways to save money or to save energy for some reason that aligns with their goals, they don't know which actions to invest their time and effort into. If they are in a position of investing in a new appliance, there are a lot of cognitive biases that will get in the way that may cause them to sort of miscalibrate the cost and benefits. There's some cost fallacy. I always use my grandparents for this example. Uh, they had a refrigerator that was older than me, but it still worked, so they kept hanging on to it, not appreciating that it is so inefficient for a 40-year-old refrigerator, when they, it finally broke and they replaced it, they saved so much money, they, they would have more than paid for the difference if they had done it earlier. But in their mind, they had spent the money on that refrigerator a long time ago, and they didn't want to waste that. There's also the challenge of evaluating more efficient goods. So these are pictures of water heaters. The one on the left is a heat pump water heater. You can see it is quite a bit pricier, $2,000 versus $539. It's also four times more efficient. So it actually would pay for itself in a few years. Now, granted, not everyone can afford that upfront cost, but there are people who can and who will miss this opportunity to save long-term. And availability bias also comes into play here that a lot of energy behaviors like insulating your home are not things that we see. And so they underestimate the importance of taking those actions. Another challenge we have with a lot of, um, especially electrification measures and renewable energy investments, 
these are relatively new technologies that people are not that familiar with. They do have that higher upfront cost. People may be worried about, are they really gonna perform and provide the savings promised? And it's really difficult to compare options. I've talked to people who are, have years of experience in the finance industry and cannot make heads or tails of different quotes they've gotten for solar. So there's also a lot of hassle factors here, which makes these behaviors sort of multi-stage decisions. It's not just, oh, I'd like to get an electric vehicle, but I have to figure out where can I get an electric vehicle? Who's going to install a charger at my home? When am I going to actually do charging? All of those additional steps can complicate the decision and lead to what we call status quo bias that we just decide not to engage in it at all. And then there's the actual design of policies that they can create frictions that make it less appealing for people to participate. So um, as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, there is the High Efficiency Electric Home Rebate Act program. This is designed specifically to help low-income households, provides rebates for 50 to 100% of the cost of different electrification measures. Whether you qualify is based on your household income relative to the area median income, which means there is no number we can publish out there where someone can quickly decide, do I, do I qualify? They're gonna have to go find a calculator or a nonprofit who has figured this out, a nonprofit program administrator who's figured this out for them. There's also a challenge of how uh, different programs and incentives stack on each other. Something we saw with rooftop solar is that in some states, if somebody took advantage of say, a state level incentive, it actually made them ineligible for a local one. It can be very complex and confusing to make sense of this. And there's also the structure of the incentives themselves. A dollar is not necessarily worth a dollar. It depends on how you're providing that incentive. So there's research showing, for example, people would much rather have an immediate sales tax waiver, even if it's worth less than say a tax credit down the line. So just to kind of wrap this up in terms of what these challenges are, people don't know what to do. It means their time and their financial resources and their effort are potentially misallocated. They have to invest a lot of effort into learning more they're probably gonna be prone to sticking with the status quo and doing nothing. And they're missing an opportunity to potentially act in ways that would fulfill some goal they already have. So to help you understand how behavioral science can overcome some of these challenges, I'll just go through a few of the common interventions. And one of these is to provide regular feedback to people. There, there are meta-analyses showing this typically saves somewhere between seven to 12%. And the benefit of this is it is making, in a sense, energy more tangible, more visible, and it is helping people disaggregate how much energy different actions use, which means people can actually learn. And maybe my grandparents would have realized, boy, whenever the refrigerator kicks on this, we're getting a, a huge spike in consumption. Now, this is an area where behavioral science is still figuring out which design is best. Some feedback people start to overlook. It just kind of fades to the background. And as you've maybe all experienced with your cell phones, we can be overloaded with information too and start to ignore it. Home energy reports are sort of a sub example of feedback. In this case, it's comparing your energy consumption to your nearest neighbors. To, and showing how you compare to the 20% most efficient. This also is helping kind of bring energy to the forefront. The utilities that use this specifically send these reports separately from the bills so that they're not worried about what they have to pay, but it's a piece of information to catch their attention. And it may help people realize there is a missed opportunity here, that somehow these other households are figuring out uh, how to use less energy and save money. The analyses of these usually show two to two and a half percent savings. And I will say part of why utilities like this program is that many of them are required to help their consumers conserve. And what it used to be was just sending little inserts and bills or maybe sending you a kit with some energy efficient light bulbs. 
And these home energy reports are far more effective than those prior tools. One of the things we're also seeing in the energy space is how important social influence is, especially when you're talking about new technologies that people are unfamiliar with. There's research showing that if you can see, say, solar panels installed someplace else or like on your neighbor's homes or you talk to your neighbors, it helps reduce how much time you spend deciding to get them for yourselves. There's also value in reducing distrust of these programs, which can be especially important for lower income households who are sometimes victimized by scams. Um, and in general, this is just, again, a really useful tool for giving people comfort in new technologies that they don't know many people with. And then the last thing I'll just talk about is um, trying to pair behavioral science with existing traditional policy tools. So a lot of policy is about information disclosure or providing incentives and not recognizing that that might not be enough to motivate people. They have limited attention. They may have other motivations besides just economic. And again, there are hassle factors. So I'm gonna just briefly share a study I did that was trying to increase the reach of a low income solar program in California. Um, what this program involved was getting people who had already gotten solar at no cost through this program to suggest other people who would qualify. And the nonprofit would give them a $200 reward for every person they referred who actually got solar. And you can see the vast majority of people had not referred before. So we took what the nonprofit typically does, remind you, you can get these $200 bucks, give us a call or go to our website to give names. We layered on uh, in a separate condition, adding in a dollar bill, which we framed as a gift, just to say thank you for being part of our solar community. And this was meant to provoke reciprocity, this feeling of if I do something nice for you, you will feel this urge to repay the favor. And so we hoped that people would, one, see this dollar bill, be reminded of, I already got this big free solar panel system. Maybe I can think of some other people who would benefit. And then the last condition had all those components, but it also just made the referral slip simpler. So or made the process of referring simpler. It included a slip where they could write names and a stamped return envelope, in addition to a phone number and a website. So the punchline is here, these two behavioral conditions were two to seven and a half times more effective depending on the outcomes than just reminding people of the economic reward alone. So that combined condition of the slip and the dollar led to five times as many people providing referrals than the control condition and just under twice as many in the dollar bill condition alone. And that combined condition was especially effective for getting people who had never referred before. So it's suggesting that there was something about that referral process that maybe was hard to figure out. And that slip actually provided information of here's what a referral requires. This is a graph of how referrals came in over time. And you can see 74% of people who got the slip used it, suggesting that convenience mattered. And then the thing we really care about, how many of these referrals led to installations? There were 2.6 as many, times as many installations in that reciprocity group and more than five times as many in that combined group. And even though these experimental conditions cost more upfront, they actually cost less per average install than the control condition. So it would be a more effective way for the nonprofit um, to attract new clients. So just to sort of sum up here of like what the potential is and why behavioral science can be beneficial, again, energy is really out of sight, out of mind for most people, making it very challenging to rationally account for it in their decision making. And these behavioral science tools can help make that more accessible and help activate some of the goals they already have. Um, and really, I, I'm someone who shies away from using the term nudge. I like to think of behavioral science as offering more than just a nudge that we can really enhance the design 
of even traditional policy tools to make them more effective. And I will close there. Thank you very much uh, to Professor Wolski for an excellent introduction. And I would like to call Professor Pelbinski for uh, an economic perspective of the welfare effects of some of the interventions. Hey, um, well, thank you so much for having me here for this um, wonderful discussion. Oh, thank you, Kim. Um, um, and let me follow on Kim's um, excellent, let's see, is there a, let me get this full screen. <laughs> So, so let me follow on Kim's excellent um, presentation and introduction of all of the potential psychological frictions um, that might lead people to not necessarily make the best possible choices and the kinds of um, nudge type instruments that might be productively deployed to help people make um, better choices and to improve social welfare. Now I have quotes here <laughs> around the word nudge because like, like Kim, I'm also a little bit um, skeptical about this word, but you know, roughly speaking, what I have in mind is the kinds of non-pecuniary um, policy tools that Kim was introducing, whether it's home energy reports or warning labels, um, leveraging defaults, and so forth. And the question that I really want to talk about is when you have this kind of non-pecuniary policy instrument, what does it mean for it to be a good one? That's question one. Number, question two, um, as Kim was just saying, we really have a very wide arsenal of different policy tools. There's lots of different ways to design a label. There's lots of different ways to design a home energy report. And then there are all these other kinds of financial tools that we can leverage. So the space of policy design is really quite large. And so when you have this kind of large space, the question is, what is, you know, if you're comparing two different choices, how do you evaluate which policy is better than another? How do you evaluate which label is the better one? Which home energy report is the better one? So that's really the focus of this discussion. How do you choose the right policy tool and how do you figure out if this policy tool is actually increasing what we might mean by societal welfare in the first place? Now in practice, you know, there's really been this huge explosion of work on, you know, again, in this broad category of things that people tend to call nudges, um, both in policy, um, as um, Professor Tor was talking about, you know, all of the work from um, different nudge units all around um, the world, you know, and certainly lots and lots of academic work from um, behavioral scientists and adjacent disciplines. And then, you know, it's um, formalized, you know, most saliently, at least in this um, paper by um, Benarzi et al. that includes authors like Cass um, Sunstein and Richard Thaler and so forth. You know, what oftentimes is the criterion that's used to evaluate whether something is good or whether something is better is just, does it have large average effects on people's behavior? So formally, a lot of the discussion is the more you can change people's behavior, the better is this non-financial lever. Now, that's different from some of the early discussions, um, including even some of the early discussions by Thaler and Sunstein themselves, um, where people have first tried to introduce the potential of non-pecuniary levers and alongside more standard economic and law and economic tools like bans and taxes and so forth, which is that, well, you know, maybe, you know, the issue with a tax or a ban is that it affects everyone, including the people who are already making good choices and are not, not subject um, to lapses of self-control, are not subject to inattention, are not subject to incorrect beliefs and so forth, all of these things that Professor Wolski was talking about. You know, we, so the blunt policy tools, nudges potentially could be better targeted tools that um, correct the behavior of the people who are making the mistakes, but leave alone the people who are not. 
And that's what people have meant by things like asymmetric paternalism or um, libertarian paternalism. Okay, and now um, what I want to talk about today is actually something just very boring, <laughs> um, you know, um, and, and which is based on a um, recent paper um, with um, Helm Alcott and several of our students, um, Danny Cohen and um, William, Mor um, William Morrison, which is let's just like sit down and really flesh out what the benefit cost analysis of these policy tools might look like. I'm not gonna to try to say, make any incredible claims. We're just really going to dot our I's and cross our T's and see where that takes us. Okay, so that's the goal. What, is, what, what are the implications for what's a better or a worse policy lever when you really do the benefit cost analysis? And so for this, I'm gonna take you through um, a simple framework, um, and I'll mostly just illustrate it with examples that uses techniques from public finance. Public finance is a field of economics that's really concerned with evaluating government policies like bans and taxes, a very long tradition of writing down um, theoretical formulas that are directly connected to the kinds of elasticities that we, and other kind of empirical statistics that we can measure in practice. And I'm gonna illustrate the lessons from these examples with, um, in the paper, there are a number of um, randomized experiments. I'm just gonna quickly go over one of them, um, which is just illustrating the quant potential quantitative importance of the kind of concepts I'm gonna talk about. Okay, now before I get to the examples, this is basically the only slide that has some, um, a, a little bit of um, math type um, variables here. Well, let me just kind of set the stage for a simplified framework that we should have in mind as I'm talking about um, the various concepts. And in fact, when I jump into an experiment, I'm gonna show you it's very much in this kind of setting. Okay, so let's just consider um, consumers who choose whether or not to buy some product or which of two products to buy, and it just has a price P, okay? That's the price, or you know, you can think of P as the relative price. Now, um, there's a notion of a true value V that this good delivers, and the way to think about it is, um, you know, if people were free of all the kinds of um, psychological frictions that Professor Wolski was talking about, how much would they value this product? That's what V is. It's how much people would value this product if they weren't subject to lapses of self-control and fully thought through the consequences of um, all of their choices. Okay, now, um, that, unfortunately, that's not always true. And so when, um, there's some bias, which here is this Greek letter gamma, which is the friction. It's the friction between the kinds of deep goals that people have and how people actually choose. And then there are some nudge type instruments like labels that might further affect people's perceived value, move people's choices, um, which have treatment effects that I'm going to label tau. Okay. And so um, when does a person buy a product? Well, when it's the true surplus, which is V, the true value minus P, plus this friction, which is gamma. So that, again, that's the wedge between kind of true goals and true values and what people actually do, plus some treatment effect that's greater than zero. Now, what the government wants to do is just maximize benefits minus costs. Okay? We just want people to kind of make good social choices and help themselves. And the government can do that either you know, with some combination of deploying a tool like a nudge that has this treatment effects tau and a standard tax or subsidy on this product. Okay? And in the background, of course, there are producers who might respond to all of these different kinds of government actions. You know, if demand for a product goes up, Oftentimes, prices will go up as well. If you tax producers, their prices will go up as well. And so these are important things to actually take into account. What are the impacts from market equilibrium? OK, so let me walk through some examples of what are some nuances in evaluating these nudges and why we want to think carefully and really dot our I's and cross our T's. So well, let me start just with a simple one that's actually about sugary drinks, and then I'll kind of talk more about um, things in the setting of environmental um, choices. So imagine you have a sugary sweetened beverage market where you know everything is good, except people sometimes make mistakes. And let's just imagine for a moment, these are just illustrative examples, that there are two types of people. One type are the oblivious consumers, 
They ignore health harms completely. They just out of sight, out of mind. And so when you ignore health harms, you're going to overconsume sugary drinks. Okay. But because you're oblivious, you're not really going to be affected by any warning label anyway. And so there's actually very little scope to move the choices of oblivious consumers by non-financial interventions. They're oblivious for a reason. It's precisely because they ignore communication. Now, there's a second type of consumer that I'm just going to call the health nut. <laughs> um, they are very attentive to health. They rarely consume sugary drinks. Now, you know, even if for a health knot on a very hot day when you're tired and you want to treat yourself, sometimes it makes sense to just have a yummy sugary drink. And so they will occasionally consume um, these drinks. But by virtue of being health knots, as soon as you slap one of these warning labels on a sugary drink, they're going to get very anxious and very tense and just stop consuming sugary drinks altogether. So for them, a warning label is actually distortionary. Okay, it makes them underconsume. So what are the key characteristics of this market? On average, people overconsume sugary drinks. And on average, a label decreases consumption of sugary drinks. And so if we go with the Benarci et al. <laughs> criteria, and imagine the labels are pretty cheap to slap on the bottles. If you go with the Benarci et al. criterion, you would think this is a successful label. Um, the truth, however, is this: this is a label that is, in this example, terrible for society. It doesn't help the people who need help, and it makes the people who were previously correctly acting suffer. So terrible label. So just because you have a label that moves direction in what might look like the right direction, it doesn't actually mean that it's increasing societal welfare. And formally, what we talk about here is that this is a poorly targeted label. Its treatment effects are not aligned with market distortions in their proper manner. <laughs> Okay, now here's a different example. Um, as, um, as Kim was talking about, you know, in the energy space, biases can go both ways. Sometimes people overestimate energy costs, sometimes they underestimate energy costs, and so it's all very heterogeneous. So imagine a market where two thirds of the people underestimate energy costs and so overconsume the less energy efficient product, um, and the label cuts the underestimation in half. Well, imagine another third overestimate energy costs, and so they underconsume the less energy efficient product, and the label fully eliminates their overestimation. Now, the way I've set this up is that on average, people overconsume energy inefficient appliances, and on average, the label actually doesn't change total consumption of energy efficient appliances because of how it moves people in opposite directions. Again, if you just take like a Bernardi et al. criterion here, you would say, well, this was a very unsuccessful nudge. It didn't change behavior on average. But that's actually the wrong conclusion. Um, this is actually a great label because it picks mistakes in both directions. The people who were overconsuming do so less, and the people who were underconsuming also do so less. So it's a win. Okay, so that's another example where average treatment effects can be extremely misleading guide to what is actually good for society. Okay, example three. Imagine we have um, a market where people overestimate the total utility of a product. Again, let's say in energy efficient appliances by one util. You know, utils as a utility function, so by just some amount. Okay, and imagine that we have a label that drives down this overestimation on average, but it's heterogeneously interpreted. You know, and again, think back to some of these labels you saw, like how do you interpret an energy star label or a home energy report? <laughs> It'd be an incredible world to live in if everyone interpreted those in the same way. That's not psychologically possible. So consider a situation where half of the consumers will decrease their perceived value by one util and half of the consumers increase their perceived value by one util. The most realistic case where this happens, and there's probably work by um, Lucas Davis and co-authors, is with labels that present national averages, like national kind of average gas costs or energy costs, that for some people are overestimates and other people are underestimates, because of course these costs are actually very, very specific to the area where people live. Now, this label reduces overvaluation over consumption on average, but it also decreases welfare. 
Okay, and why? Well, whenever you have people interpret something in very idiosyncratically heterogeneous ways, what you're doing is you're adding a lot of noise to markets. And noise is a bad thing. You know, you've, it's basically like you've created a lot of a lot more biases and noisy mistakes in the market, which leads to less efficient allocations. Okay. Example four. Okay, and this illustrates what I was kind of saying from the uh, initially also, why is it important to take into account how prices are actually set and how market equilibrium works? So imagine now a market where supply is fixed. And again, this is an extreme example, but something like a used car market. It's a market with fairly inelastic, pretty much fixed supply. Imagine that we have consumers who are homogeneously biased. They make a homogeneous mistake. You know, they over they underestimate the cost of buying a gas guzzler, for example. And imagine you have a label that actually seems on the face of it really great because it basically just eliminates mistakes for half of the consumers completely. So it makes them think very clearly, very rationally, half consumers, so we eliminate mistakes. The other half, however, is not affected by the label because maybe they miss it. They don't pay attention to it, they don't get the mailer, okay? This sounds great, right? This actually sounds like an example of libertarian or asymmetric paternalism from some of the early writing from the early 2000s. This actually is also an example of where you don't, if you don't fully think through the cost benefit analysis, you're going to reach the wrong conclusion because even though it helps consumers choose better, it's still bad for welfare. Okay, so this one is a little more, more subtle. Um, but again, this goes back to, okay, I'm running short of time, so, so yeah, but I think the examples are kind of the heart of this. So, um, but th this, this goes back to thinking about market response, okay, um, and misallocation. So with fixed supply, what's going to happen for the market to clear is if everyone overvalues the gas guzzlers, it just means the price of the gas guzzlers is going to go up and it's going to offset that overvaluation. Okay. So if everyone is biased in the same way, you still have a market where the people to whom the product is still most valuable are gonna be the ones who purchase it. Okay. So it's an efficient allocation in the market. When you de-bias half of the people, you don't have an, efficiently alloc an efficient allocation anymore because now what's gonna happen is that it's not just the true value that determines who buys the product, but it's also whether or not you were de-biased. And the reason that average bias doesn't matter here is because supply is fixed. So the same number of people are always going to purchase the product. And the only question is, who are those people? Okay. And it's going to be the right people when everyone is homogeneously biased. It's going to be sometimes the wrong people when some are biased and some are not. And again, what this illustrates is the importance of reducing the, heter the heterogeneity of distortions in the market. Sometimes a homogeneous bias is better than a society in which some people are biased and some people are not. So heterogeneity of psychological frictions is very bad for welfare and something that needs to be accounted for carefully. Now, just to speed up, by the same token, imagine we're in a situation where we already have some taxes. You know, for example, in the energy space, we have gasoline taxes, we have cafe standards, which are implicit taxes that raise the prices of certain goods. When we're talking about sugary drinks, you know, the number of countries and various cities in the US are adopting taxes on sugary drinks. And it's the same idea. Average biases matter less when you have a tax that's already counteracting the average distortion. What really matters more is the heterogeneity of the bias that remains after you introduce such a label. So again, you can have labels that you bias some of the consumers, but not others. But in the presence of a one cent brown tax like we have in the Bay Area, they might actually be bad for welfare because the one cent brown tax already offsets um, a lot of the distortion, which we actually in a previous paper estimate, one cent brown is actually right around the optimum <laughs> um, in the case of sugary drinks markets. Okay. so. What we do in this paper, so these are examples that motivate formulas that really say, okay, so if you're really doing this rigorous cost-benefit analysis, here's how you can measure various kinds of statistics, which are not just average effects, but also how the effects of your knowledge 
relate to people's biases or externalities, and here's how you can come out with an answer to whether benefits exceed costs for uh, a certain kind of policy instrument. And one of the places where we do this is in the case of um, a um, evaluating existing auto um, kind of fuel economy labels, where the goal here is not to innovate a label. The goal here is just to take some labels that people have proposed and show how you can combine our framework with an evaluation of these kinds of labels. So we ran experiments where people are choosing between less and more energy efficient cars with control groups where we don't present the labels and treatment groups where we present the labels. And you know, this is kind of roughly how it looks like where people are making incentivized online choices between different kinds of um, autos and we have a way of estimating bias in this experiment. And roughly speaking, here's what the results um, look like. So one, these nudges have very, uh, these labels have very heterogeneous effect on people's valuations for um, the less versus more um, energy efficient um, autos, um, as this histogram shows. So people in the treatment group have much more dispersed valuations relative to people in the control group. They also have average effects driving down people's valuations for the auto, so they look like they're in the right direction. However, they're not better targeted in the sense that these labels don't have larger effects on people with larger biases, i.e. people who underestimate fuel, fuel costs the most than people with um, lower biases. And so when you combine this, what you have is actually um, a label which has very heterogeneous treatment effects, but it is not actually targeted towards the people who are making the biggest mistakes. Rather, these are labels who move behavior in the right direction, but they also introduce a lot of noise in the market. And so when you take all these empirical statistics and run them through the cost-benefit analysis um, framework that we introduce, what you find is that in the case of cars, even absent any regulations, these labels are not actually doing more harm than good. And when you have a tax that's close to the optimum, they're really doing more harm than good. And so the, with the takeaway recap is, you know, it's not that nudges are bad. It's rather that we should be careful to dot our I's and cross our T's when we um, evaluate them. And in particular, what we should be very careful about is how heterogeneously they might be interpreted because of how it can add noise to the market and make um, what people do a lot less um, efficient. And, you know, um, and you know, and those are kind of the implications for design. The way I envision this is again, it's just a warning label of why we need a warning message about why we need to be careful in evaluating them. You know, the productive way to go, I think, is to take more comprehensive um, cost-benefit analysis frameworks, you know, like the kind I suggested, and combine them with further psychological <laughs> insights about how to design nudges that don't just have the largest effects on behavior, but really actually maximize benefits. Um, minus costs. And, you know, again, food for thought, look at these existing labels and ask yourself, which of these labels are likely to be interpreted in the way that we want them to be versus they might be adding a lot of noise um, because different people will interpret them in highly different ways. Um, so let me end here and I look forward to further discussion. <laughs> right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gabinski. And now we're going to have uh, Professor Vanderberg uh, present uh, another perspective. Fantastic. And uh, it's going to take me a second. I'm a, a techno peasant, so I'm sure it'll take me a minute to get these set up. Maybe, let's see. Let's escape. Escape. Escape from the Tobinsky talk. That was a joke. Okay. All right. So uh, while I'm starting here, see if that's it. That's it. Um, let me just say that uh, when I was a, a cub lawyer, uh, literally been out of uh, law school for about six months, um, I had written my note on biotechnology regulation, and I was extremely critical of the way the federal government was regulating biotechnology. And uh, I tend to be kind of a centrist myself, and I, I kept in lots of different directions and gave a talk uh, in front of about a thousand uh, people in DC in a major hotel ballroom, not knowing that. The entire front two rows would be all the EPA staff who wrote the regulation. I'm okay. I go into the men's room afterwards and I'm washing my hands, and there's a guy standing next to me washing his hands. 
Uh, and he uh, obviously doesn't know who I am. He says, uh, you know, I've never heard anybody talk that fast. And I thought, that's me, and I, you know, I'm, you're going to hear it again. So I'm going to talk really fast. I've got about 100 things to say. I've got almost no time to do it. Um, and, uh, and so I apologize in advance uh, for the speed, and I'm happy to take calls and emails and things of that nature. So uh, as Arishal mentioned, uh, I have a background. Uh, I've worked in politics. I've uh, been the chief of staff at the EPA. I've been a partner at a law firm representing major investment banks and private equity firms and Fortune 100 companies. Um, and I now chair the board of the 10th largest public uh, distribution utility in the United States, which is engaging in exactly these kinds of activities. So the kind of analysis we just heard from both of our two prior speakers was very valuable to me. And I think I actually understood uh, the Tavinsky talk better now than I did at dinner last night. I know more about how we might use what you're talking about. What I try to do is to take a problem-focused uh, approach to the kinds of issues, and I have found over time that um, uh, that if you start with a problem focus and you get out of the disciplinary stovepipes that we typically use, you can solve many problems that are otherwise very difficult to solve. Uh, and let me just start with a couple of quotations that I think uh, will help uh, help us think about. Um, how to get the most out of behavioral intervention, whether they're called nudges or not. And, and the first is just to look at the, the goal that we worked out back and forth as, as I got responses from um, Professor Tor. The goal here, I think, is to present perspectives on the assessment of household energy conservation policies and potential lessons for behavioral interventions more generally. And what I'm going to try to do is to tell you that the biggest risk you face, this is true for you as a lawyer, it's also true for people in economics and psychology and other fields, is that we all get a mental model. And by the time you say you're thinking like a lawyer, that's usually very good, but it also means it's hard not to think like a lawyer. And sometimes to be a successful lawyer, you have to not think like a lawyer. And the same is true for economists and psychologists, in my experience. Uh, each group brings its own set of implicit and explicit assumptions to the table that limit their ability to function. So how, how do we uh, capture some of that here? John Kenneth Goldberg, faced with a choice between changing one's mind and proving there's nothing to do. So almost everyone gets busy uh, with the proof, right? That's what I want you not to do. Keep an open mind here. Remember that you're functioning in a particular mental model, and it's going to make you resistant to some of the ideas I'm going to talk about, because the ideas I'm going to talk about present across all these different issues. And Kahneman, who just recently passed away, and of course is the, the progenitor of much of the work we're all talking about, I can only explain it by a weakness of the scholarly mind that I've often observed in myself. I call it a theory-induced blindness. Once you've accepted a theory and used it in your own thinking, it's extraordinarily difficult to notice its faults. Right? And I think one of the values you all bring to the table as lawyers is that you will have to work with experts from lots of different people. And what you can help them do is identify where those places are where they've got theory and who's blindness, because I can promise you the attorney on the other side will do it if you don't do it in advance and correct. Right. So, uh, so do that kind of thing. So I uh, actually have a, a new book out with uh, Sarah Light at Wharton and Jim Salzman at UCLA. And uh, I have a question and the student that answers this question correctly gets a free copy of the book. Come up to me afterwards. So uh, who recently announced an initiative to reduce worldwide greenhouse gas emissions by 1 billion tons by 2030? Free copy of the book. Yes. China. Okay, that's good, but not right. Another one? Yeah. Walmart. Walmart. That's right. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, oh, that's a That's a phone goal right there. Uh, so I get asked this usually over a hundred audience, and almost always what I get is the government answer. It's California. It's Belgium. It's Germany. It's whatever. But it's Walmart. Right, and so uh, my question to you is: If what we're talking about here is conservation policy today, hasn't our language already put us in the middle of the box? We're thinking about policy. When you hear the word policy, do you think about Walmart looking at the Environmental Defense Fund and the World Wildlife Fund to commit to carbon emissions reductions equal to the whole emissions for this country of Germany? I don't think so. Right. So what this book is all about is environmental governance, private environmental governance, which sometimes supplements public environmental governance. For example. 20% of all the fish caught for human consumption in the world are regulated by a private certification standard, which was created when the international system failed to be able to adopt those standards. So from my perspective, the key thing from a mental model perspective, in addition to one of your colleagues getting a free amazing book, is the idea that we've got to be careful even how we frame the problems we have. 
Because that framing can then lead us down the line, and every field does this. And in this case, I would say we're doing something a little more than conservation policy, but we're starting with that. So when it comes to nudges, some people say I do nudge work, and I really pride with that. And I think Kim does as well, uh, because I think what I'm doing is much broader than nudges. And what I want to talk about is what I think of as the nudge paradox, which is on the one hand, it has had amazingly positive framing effects. People around the world, as you've seen, are engaged in nudge work. They know about it. It's common. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's focused attention on a limited subset of behaviors and interventions that make it hard to achieve a difference. The second thing that's done is it's kind of been, um, it's attracted uh, behavioral economics, which is hugely powerful, but only one piece of the broader set of ways that you study human behavior that are relevant to changing household energy consumption and carbon emissions. And I think it's exacerbated the division between behavioral economics and some of the behavioral sciences. I'd like to see us take a problem solving approach to try to beat that problem. So let me give you some examples of how that framing has narrowed our ability to think about the opportunity in, in the household sector. So this is a chart from the House Commerce Committee when it was considering the last remark and cap and trade bill in 2008. And the residential share is only 5%. And the report accompanying this chart said, let's not worry about the residential share. It's only 5%. Well, how did they get to 5%? They got there by excluding the household contribution to electricity generation and the household contribution to transportation generation carbon emissions. Right? If you put those in, it's between 20 and 40 percent. And now you can't solve the problem now dealing with it. And that's what we do here, what I think of as a behavioral wedge effect. A group of us published a series of papers on this. And what it shows is when you get to calling them households and you fold in what has substantial direct control over household electricity generation and transportation, you get between, again, 20 and 40 percent. In this case, we estimated 31 percent. So just whether we call it the residential share or the household share and how we think about that can affect not only the importance of the problem, but also then the implements you can use to change the behavior. Because if electricity generation is a utility's fault, then we only have a couple of tools we can use. If it's also household responsibility, now we broaden the number of tools, we can try to change household behavior as well. So uh, a second concern that I have about framing around nudges is it tends to induce us to think about consumers uh, and maybe some household behavior. But you all play an enormous uh, enormously broad number of roles when you have huge effects on U.S. greenhouse gas emissions and energy consumption, which is what I care about. And these are some that we have time in the questions. We can talk more about these. By the way, we're at a capital institution. Uh, for a prior book, a group of colleagues and I, have businesses and a few others, did a carbon footprint at Catholic Church. Uh, and it would be, if it were a country, one of the top 50 carbon emitting countries in the world. So you think about the importance of your role within a religious group, you can also change institutions, including religious institutions along the way. Uh, the second thing that I would say is we talk about conservation policy. And if you look in some of the literature in this area, particularly in the legal literature and the behavioral economic literature, you see that the behavior that's targeted as conservation, right? But if you talk to people in uh, behavioral sciences, what they will tell you is that conservation is the least promising of the types of household behavior. And so in the work that I do uh, with this behavioral wage paper at PNAS and others is that we think not about conservation, or sometimes it's called curtailment, where you have to sacrifice in order to get something. You have to wear a sweater because you turn down the thermostat, but rather efficiency. Can we induce you to buy a more efficient HVAC system in the first place? So one of the things that I would argue is that we have to be careful not to let you go more to policy or conservation uh, be what we focus on because it narrows the opportunities here. And in our paper, we found that efficiency was about twice as uh, uh, promising as uh, conservation. How big a deal is all of this? Well, the U.S. is actually in pretty good shape in terms of carbon emissions reductions. And about half of the reductions that we got from 2005, which was our high point, to 2017, occurred through lower demand growth, combination of efficiency and conservation. So it's hugely important. We talk all the time about carbon taxes and cap and trade and regulations, but efficiency is driving much of this change. So in the paper we did, we tried to introduce something else as well, which is that we need to think much more broadly than just United States. And when we do that, we need to think both about the technical potential, that is, if everyone changed behavior, what would the emissions production be? And behavioral plasticity, how changeable is that behavior? So I think one place that the uh, non-economic behavioral scientists can learn from behavioral uh, economics is to think about costs, to think about plasticity behavior. I think 
many of the people who do the psychologically driven work and sociologically driven work don't think enough about how you set up and cost out and manage a program. And as a result, it becomes less helpful uh, in the policy making process. So we identified these 17 behaviors and we concluded that emissions reductions equal to the country of France could be achieved every year in the United States by focusing on non-intrusive methods that focus on households. I'll talk more about these in just a second. Um, and you mentioned Lucas Davis before, and, and this is actually a chart from him. Many people in the United States don't know that household per capita electricity consumption peaked several years ago and is actually going down. Right now, why did that happen? Well, um, what Davis did that I thought was a brilliant one was he just looked at what the uh, emissions reductions effects were of the uptake of LED and CFL lighting. And what he found is a very close correlation between the uptake of more uh, efficient light bulbs in homes and the leveling off and decline in household per capita consumption. So my point is simply, if, if you want to say it's just a nudge, well, maybe, but that's a profound thing. The households in the United States uh, emit as much carbon as all the sources in all the countries in, in Central and South America. So when we level off and reduce our household electricity consumption on a per capita basis, that's a huge thing. Jonathan Gillick and the physicist at Bandy and I calculated that those emissions reductions are equal to about 130 million metric tons a year. Uh, and what, why did that happen? It happened because first there were government standards. They produced ugly light bulbs that were expensive. Then Walmart said to its suppliers, if you can give us a more efficient uh, LED that's attractive for under $10, we'll make it our house brand. And it did that. And the combination tracks almost exactly that, any, that uptake uh, of LEDs. It's not the only reason, but it's a piece of it. So we see that both public and private governments uh, are at work here. Uh, another phenomenon that if you take a broader perspective and don't just think about nudges and think in narrow discipline areas that we need to account for is that many of us are functioning in ways that are far more driven today by group identity or partisan identity than we are by only terms of And that is a real challenge to energy policy and frankly to our democracy itself. And here's just one example of that, which essentially suggests that uh, you can create substantial, substantially less interest in CFLs uh, among conservatives when you add a green label, right? So a simple answer might be, hey, let's just green label things, everybody loves the environment, but no, if in certain situations, a conservative sees a green label, what does that message to them? Other groups, not my group, right? So I'm not gonna buy that label, even if it will save you money, right? So if we don't account for those effects, as a policymaker, I'm saying, like, why are you coming in front of me arguing for or against certain policies? This is what's driving behavior. Let me give you another example of this from Lockheed Hawkins. Is right in the back. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you didn't answer the question before. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, um, so he's got work underway. We have a grant from the Iron Stack Bay Settlement Fund, and we're studying the combination of identity effects and price on the uptake of LEDs. And effectively, what he's showing us here is that conservatives who received a statement associating EVs with liberals were 13 percentage points or 36 percent less likely to select that EV than control conservatives. And that effect is very strong, particularly among conservative males. Very little effect among conservative females. So, in other words, that group identity or partisan identity, if you're making all kinds of assumptions about energy and climate policy and not accounting for it, you're missing something really important. Now we've got this too, and we'll, we'll get to that later in the question if we want. Uh, Mariah Caballero is here as well. Mariah is a PhD student as well, and she is the lead author in this piece we just had in January in Energy Policy. And this gets to this question of the problem of nudge, the inherent definition that Sunstein and Thaler used of a nudge, uh, any aspect of the choice architecture that affects people's um, uh, let's see, uh, behaviors in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing economic considerations. So what has Congress done? It has passed the largest climate bill in our lifetimes, and did it use nudge strategies? No, it didn't. Although behavioral science might inform what it did, what it did was subsidize the decarbonization of the American society, and how did it do that in ways that matter for a nudge analysis? We took the nudge type behaviors, EV uptake, um, uh, by uh, fuel efficient heat pumps, fuel efficient HVAC systems, et cetera. We took those together. We found that Congress put about $39 billion or $12 billion of the IRA, 12% uh, in, uh, of the IRA into uh, behavior focused programs, household focused programs, and that those um, investments may yield as much as 40% of the emissions reductions that will occur from the IRA. So, does it matter? 
you decide do we care about that 40 percent or not as transmission becomes blocked more and more that number is going to go up then so uh another way to think about the importance of not staying within the same mental model we tend to think of a label as being directed at consumers and then we study the willingness to pay consumers in uh, when exposed to different labels and I would argue, based on a piece we published in Nature Climate Change about a year and a half ago, that that's only half of the way we should be thinking about labels. That instead, uh, labels very often, even if they don't change consumer behavior, they change firm behavior. Uh, and an example of this would be Walker's Crisps, the largest potato chip maker in England. They had this problem of calling them crisps. I don't know why. But you put that aside for a second. They were under a lot of pressure from uh, the carbon trust in England to, to carbon label their potato chips. So for the first time ever, they went back and studied the carbon footprint of their supply chain. And what did they find? They found that they were buying potatoes by the pound. By buying them by the pound, they were inducing farmers to dig them when they're wet. Farmers then had to humidify their warehouses to keep them wet, and they had to transport heavy potatoes as well, right? And so it was the, it was the pressure to label that induced the company to find efficiencies. We identified multiple examples of that. And so what does that mean for all our purposes? If you're just going to focus on carbon labeling a product, you want the label for consumer behavior. You want it to be simple, something like the left uh, two here. But if what you want is to force companies to conduct the kind of analysis that will induce them to find efficiency, then what you want to do is something more on the right, where you're actually using them to measure and disclose specific amounts of carbon. So it's a different label. Your theory about how it's having an effect is different. But analysis that only studies the label without thinking of its effect on the organization is fine. It's a start, but it can completely miss the organizational effects of a, of a label. Um, so another effect that, that I was hoping when I first started working in this area that we might be able to buy is what's called solution version. Uh, and this happens on the left and the right. Uh, Campbell and Kay at Duke were the first to really come out with this. We published several papers on this. So the idea is um, when a liberal hears that nuclear power is the answer to climate change, they get less worried about, nuclear power, about climate change. When a conservative hears that government regulation is the answer to uh, climate change, they get less worried about climate change. Of course, neither of those is a rational response in a very basic way. Um, and so I, I just give you this example from Catherine Hayhoe, who's the chief scientist of Nature Conservancy. After speaking to a group of Texas producers in Amarillo, one man said it best, everything you've said makes sense, and I'd love to agree with you, but if I agree with you, I have to agree with Al Bright. No. <laughs> right? Uh, their solution to emergence. In fact, I, you're attaching me to the identity of someone who has a solution, and I, I just can't live with that. I've been hoping that libertarian paternalism might have put up you the conservatives, but I think what we're seeing more and more instead is this. Here's Glenn Beck. Uh, Cass Sunstein is the most dangerous man in America. Um, uh, a bill that was presented for DOE to do a Dutch program is called mind control, right? And so what's fascinating to me is that the analysis hasn't bypassed solution diversion as much as I would expect it to, but it still provides some opportunities in some areas when it's not intrusive and non-regulatory. This just suggests that a very well-known program, which is under study, and I think something we should all kind of do jointly, by Stern and Aronson found a 10x difference in the outcomes uh, in energy programs with the same price difference. In other words, other factors other than price were changing the outcomes of the program, energy efficiency and conservation, by 10x. That suggests that we need to keep digging more deeply on this. Okay. Another reason to try to take multidisciplinary approaches, when I started working in this area, I kept hearing from economists about payback effects or Jevons effect or rebound. And I started realizing that any economic term for what happens after you take a first pro-environmental behavior is negative. Buy an air conditioner uh, that's more efficient, use more energy, same amount of carbon emissions, right? And I realized that we were building in negativity with simply all the terms we use. So what I did is came up with uh, with Alpha Weber at Princeton and some others, and we used the term spillover effects, and we identified that there were both negative spillover effects, like a lot of the ones that economists have, but there are also positive spillover effects. If I associate a first environmental step uh, with uh, a moral guilt, then you're going to get guilt alleviation. You're going to do something bad. If I associate that first step with your pro-environmental identity and you feel important about that, you're going to do a next good step uh, as well. So there's an example of this broader trend. So government has really struggled. This is uh, all the major international governmental effects as the Earth gets warmer and carbon concentrations get higher. So uh, many of us are starting to say we've got to think about feasibility. 
It's not enough to think about different policies in the abstract and discount feasibility. I've been hearing about carbon pricing since I was the EPA chief of staff in the early Paleolithic, and we're still talking about it, right? So, um, so isn't it true that because 57 to 60 percent of Americans support uh, doing something more about climate change, which is true, uh, that uh, that we're there, like we're about to have a, a major new environmental uh, a regulatory or tax uh, bill anytime soon. And I would say, no, that's Disney law. Disney's law. Wishing will make it so. Right? Why is that true? 18% of the U.S. population controls 52 votes in the United States Senate. Those people live in the state where I come from, Tennessee, and Idaho, and Indiana. They don't live in New York and California. So if you don't change that 18%, you don't get legislation through Congress, with one exception, which is that you can get subsidies, which is what I'm talking So uh, we have had roughly two dozen major pollution control statutes. Uh, in the first 20 years of environmental law, we've had at best one since then. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, and why is that true? For this effect that we often don't study in those studies that I keep coming back to, which is partisan or group identity. Here are the uh, the votes of uh, Democrats across the top and Republicans across the bottom. This is scored by the League of Conservation Voters. So how green are you in effect? And you see that when I became the EPA chief of staff, I helped the country open up a major gap between the R's and the B's on this kind of thing. I apologize to all of you for helping with that. But notice what 1990 does. It correlates beautifully with the shutdown of the adoption of major pollution control statutes. So if your whole analysis is comparing nudges to something that we can't achieve, are you really trying to solve the problem? And that's my concern. We always have to ask as compared to what. Uh, and what we've seen is Republicans have become less interested and concerned about climate change uh, as more information has gathered. Democrats a little bit more, and independents have stayed about the same. So what Kimbolsky and others do is, is advocate for the wedges. That's what I've written a lot of papers on as well. We're looking for micro, or not micro, but small solutions that will aggregate up and uh, and uh, trying to add more rigor, borrowing from economics uh, into the psycho psychological literature. And I want to stop with this, which is the psychology tells us that if you are depressed, you will not act, right? So it's important to be optimistic. I start every environmental law class with a slide on why you should be optimistic. And the generation is deeply not optimistic. Here's one example. We are actually beginning to level off atmospheric increases in CO2 emissions. And here's the most important one from my perspective. Here is uh, New York City streetscape in 1900. Anybody see a car? No, all horses. Look, 13 years later, anybody see a horse? No, right? Now, the, the horse lobby was not able to convince people that horses were, or cars were liberal vehicles. So it was a different era. But what I can show you is even without government policy, major transitions can occur. And I think we can still get that if we electrify the motor vehicle fleet, electrify transportation, and uh, decarbonize electricity, we can get 70% emissions reduction with very low uh, intrusiveness. So that's, uh, that's my kind of talk. Uh, thank you, Professor for a very uh, rich and provocative uh, presentation. Uh, John, please, uh, for the first of our comments. So, uh, as I saw have said, uh, you know, I'm just a general applied econometric guy, so, you know, I don't do energy policy, I don't even really do behavioral stuff, and so you sort of wonder why I'm here. Um, uh, it's, it's Indiana. Who doesn't want to come to Indiana in April? <laughs> no. yeah, when you plead in Philadelphia, it's uh, not as funny as that joke even thought. No. So back when I started my career in 2004, um, I did something that wasn't very smart. So I decided to start fighting with Dick Taylor and Cass Sunstein on hurdles and, and behavioral stuff. Now, in my defense, I was sitting at George Mason, not a place known to generate um, folks who then forget to places like that in Notre Dame or fancy places like that, so maybe it worked out. But what were my concerns with the libertarian paternalism and behaviorally kind of um, uh, informed uh, regulation? Well, there were a handful. Um, one of them was actually kind of deeply informed by my friend Greg Mitchell, who's a, a social psychologist. He's also pretty um, skeptical of this stuff, and it actually hits on uh, some of what Dimitri was talking about. Greg said to me, you know, these guys are talking about these effects as if they're sort of ubiquitous. Um, a, they're not. They're context-dependent. B, they're person-dependent. There's huge amounts of heterogeneity and variance. And yet these guys are talking about it as if we know the answers. That, that was one thing that sort of worried me. 
The other thing that worried me is coming from George Mason, my first kind of model of the world to, to take Michael's kind of language is public choice economics, which is do not think romantically about anyone's motivations, right? And so you know, I was trying to think, oh, you know, we're the government, we're here to help you, right? Um, you know, particularly a lot of some of the early nudge stuff, it was talking about you know, how can we get people to achieve what they want to achieve anyway? And it's like, well, why do I need the government to sort of do that? Oh no, it's because you're too dumb. We won't call you too dumb because psychologically you don't feel good when we call you too dumb, but really because we think you're too dumb and it's in your benefit to sort of trick you. And you know, thinking like a public choicer, I immediately started to think, well, first of all, why are you applying a different model to the people you're trying to help than you're applying to you yourself? Why isn't Cass Sunstein? Why isn't Dick Taylor too dumb? Or maybe more importantly, why do we assume that their incentives are particularly good? Or even if we want to say, hey, you know, Cass Sunstein, he's if you're Glenn Beck, you already think he's the worst guy in the world, but you know, if you're somebody else, if you're somebody at a standard law school faculty, you think, well, he's a great guy, he's only here to help people. Fine, but it's not going to be Cass Sunstein making decisions, right? It's going to be sort of other bureaucrats who are mostly being fed lines by lobbyists, you know, Michael in his earlier life, me and some of my kids all do money. I only litigated, I never won. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Right, and so you know, that's a big worry that I've got coming from this public choice sort of world saying, okay, you know, they're presenting themselves sort of romantically. They only want to sort of help people, but what are the incentives that are going to apply? And, and so how does this then sort of feed into kind of some later things that I did actually with Avi Shalom? Interestingly enough, we've seen mentioned a couple times this Bernatsky paper that sort of says, should the government in, engage in more nudging? And, and shocker, they come up with the answer, yes. Right? You know, these guys who have been advocating budgeting and, and things like that. And one of the interesting things that I was looking and I did is we sort of said, you know, even put aside the fancy stuff that Dimitri wants to do, which is, you know, order the magnitude more sophisticated than what we did. We said, let's just do basic cost benefit analysis using sort of the average effects. And it turns out, shocker, that Sunstein and Baylor et al. kind of conveniently, perhaps accidentally, sort of miss some very basic stuff. Right? In some instances, they include pure transfers as costs. In other instances, they treat them differently. Some instances, they sort of didn't account for opportunity costs. And you know what? When you went through and you did basic cost-benefit stuff, shockingly enough, it turned out most of the nudges that they said, hey, these are great, sure, we should invest more in, didn't actually pass its tax. Now, you know, who knows, right? You know, I'd rather be charitable um, than not. Maybe they just sort of made behaviorally um, uh, predictable sort of mistakes. Maybe it was more strategic, who knows? But all I know is, is that at the end of the day, they came up with the answer they probably wanted to come up with before they even did the analysis. And so those things sort of worry me quite a lot. Um, so I, I guess, how much more time do I have? Oh, sure. Two minutes. Okay, so why don't I sort of, we can do a lot at the round table. One of the things uh, Michael sort of hit on at the very end was this sort of, idea of, you know, should we be thinking in terms of feasibility and, you know, the economists talk about carbon taxes, but those are a no-go, so we need to do this other stuff. And I stop and think to myself, well, what's your vision of government, right? If we don't get carbon taxes through, if they're the kind of the first order solution to the problem, the reason we got them through shouldn't be because we assume people are too dumb, maybe, right? Maybe we should think that's not actually what people want. And that may sound shocking to you, right? You may have heard climate change is existential risk. No doubt it is in a sense. But if you go back to some of the early cost benefit for the climate risk stuff, everything comes down as to what is your social discount rate, right? You know, if it turns out you have a high sort of discount rate for the future, future generations, none of this stuff we should engage in. If you have a low social discount rate, you know, you should you should invest essentially everything to avoid these things, right? And that's to my mind, sort of a political decision. It's not an expert decision. That's a normative determination. And no doubt you can find philosophical experts on both sides of this, right? Derek Carpet, super famous philosopher, says we should have a zero social discount. If you want to go to the economist, Tyler Cowan, he wrote that paper with him. He's an economist. But there are other people that say, that's nuts, right? People in the future, they're richer than us. In the future, there's lots of other uncertainty. These are all reasons why we should discount future generations more. 
So one of my deep worries, and it sort of goes back to some of the concerns I had in 2004, was that a lot of these folks who are trying to kind of present these um, you know, doing it for your own good kinds of stories are really sneaking in lots of normative stuff without kind of being above board of that. So those are my words. Professor Craig, for opening the conversation, and we'll, our last commentator will be uh, Professor Heath. Well, let me just begin by uh, thanking these fantastic guests for making the track out here to South End. Uh, these great presentations. They set the table really, really well. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to an outstanding QA and to opening the floor to you all because I think that's where the heart of this conversation will be. So, realizing that I am the only thing standing between you and a copy break, I'm going to keep my uh, comments. Um, uh, really short, and just try to summarize for you all in case you fell asleep last time in 20 minutes. Roughly, what has been said, we've got two people here, Michael and Emily, who uh, have roughly, I think, told you that there are low hanging fruit out there, and that if we adopt the right uh, behavioral uh, uh, programs, particularly for programs, that we can uh, pick some of those low hanging fruit and that we can make uh, meaningful changes to the energy sector, to uh, household behaviors that will contribute largely to solving uh, the greenhouse gas emission problem and importantly to solving that problem. Uh, the other two presenters here uh, have, um, have uh, not only in their comments today but in their published work have said, hey, wait, maybe not so fast. Um, there are aspects of the problem that you're not considering. These nudges are not cost-free. Sometimes biases are good. Sometimes the, the interventions themselves might be more expensive uh, than you're letting on. Uh, as Dimitri said, you've got to dot your I's. You've got to dot your T, across your T's, dot your T's, you got to cross your T's. Uh, Really carefully before you uh, just willy nilly accept these uh, these interventions as being uh, as being effective ones. Uh, so where uh, where does that leave us? The devil is very much in the details, then, right? Whether we whether we decide a behavioral intervention is a is a good policy or not, uh, it's not just something we can just sort of uh, you know just sort of pluck out of the ether or say on the basis of our our, our mental model. It's something that we can only uh, conclude after doing a lot of hard work. But do we have the resources to do all that hard work? Do we have the resources to engage in the kind of careful analysis that we did to you know, subjecting this, this uh, sugary beverage? or use car buying decision to a, a rigorous analysis like that? Obviously, we don't, right? And so we're right back in some uh, uh, regard to kind of where we started, where we have a couple people who their work um, has led them to believe that on balance, we got to consider these kinds, of, uh, these kinds of interventions a lot, and other people who have a bit more skepticism. Now, I think that's really interesting, because what that means, in effect, is that uh, the application of really sophisticated research um, um, methods has, in, in, you know, we might at least be ca cautiously say, has created the very kinds of bias that we're worried about, right? Uh, it's created in ourselves as researchers biases that make us more inclined to one or the other uh, kind of, uh, of, a, um, uh, of, a, of, a, of an approach. Uh, at our dinner conversation last night, we had a really interesting conversation about the, the boundaries of very dis uh, various disciplines. And I jokingly made one point of the conversation uh, said that, that we could agree that sociology is like the least, least useful discipline or something like that. I now I repent of that view entirely. And I, as I listen to this conversation unfold today, I really think that actually the sociology of uh, of uh, accretive intellect, intellectual knowledge is actually a huge thing that we can pay attention to here. Behavioral work, as was implied earlier, is really sexy right now, and a ton of intellectual energy is being devoted to behaviorally informed research. Is it too much? I don't know, but it really, it very well may be, right? It may be that we are spending a lot of cycle trying to figure out if these tweaks are going to help uh, when, in fact, the, the, you know, the downsides may be greater than the upsides. Who knows? Uh, now, so uh, at the end of the day, given my who knows, uh, where do I think that maybe more work ought to be directed? I just want to pick up on a couple points that were made uh, in, a, in these presentations uh, and in some of the uh, publications that were circulated uh, previously. Number one, I think that um, this issue of activating partisan identity is a really big one. Uh, and, and that, uh, I mean, that, that is staggering to me to think that people would simply say, like, I'm not, I'm just going to buy that thing that has got that label that's going to make you feel like a greenie, like a tree hugger, like a cougar, you know? Uh, that, um, that, that is, a, uh, is really just alarming. I want to ask you to just do a quick thought experiment. Like, if you could go back in time and ask real aggressive climate talks in 2008, and say to them, if you knew that right now, today, by taking the foot off the gas rhetorically, 
on your position. Say just back off on your on your rhetoric by 25%. You diminish the likelihood of a Trump election by 25%. Would they take that bet? Would you take that bet? Right? You you see what I'm getting at? Uh, what I'm asking you to consider is that uh, the very um, uh, um, approaches that we take, the way we speak about, they have uh, external effects that far transcend just the micro policy that we're looking at, right? And that the meta effects then of those things, like of activating the, you know, the Trump backlash to the Obama greenism or whatever, right, might swamp whatever effects we're talking about at the policy specific level. So if, if, if uh, and, and so uh, you know, if, if, uh, as a political scientist, I would say. Uh, we need to spend a lot more time thinking about how, as Charles Lindbaum famously said a uh, past century ago, policies create politics. And think about the ways that, the, that, we, that we talk about and implement policies, uh, create political spheres and political forces that then can come back and bite us uh, big time. So that's one thing. The other thing uh, that was uh, briefly mentioned at, at a couple of points here is the idea that there are moral or emotional costs or taxes that are imposed by behavioral regulation. I think that's a really, really uh, important point. One of the things that came out in um, one of the papers was the idea, uh, I'm sure I know you've done some work on this as well, about how, um, uh, you know, if you put like a graphic warning label on a cigarette pack, uh, yeah, you're maybe discouraging a few people from smoking, but you're making, you're, you're taking all the people who are smoking and you're making them feel worse about themselves, right? And worse about their smoking, and you're causing them to worry about the fact that they are here smoking their sink. You, you've deprived them of the enjoyment of smoking their sink, right? <laughs> Which is not, in, in, in every instance, going to be a trivial, uh, a trivial thing. And so when people are sometimes asking, like, about the climate uh, 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 crisis, you know, what's worse than an unmitigated climate crisis? A unmitigated mental health crisis tied on top of an unmitigated climate crisis, right? Uh, so the last thing I want you all is to walk around without Mike's hope that there are solutions out there to solve this problem. No, I want you, if we're gonna, you know, burn up the world, let's burn it up happily. Because if we don't have some depression, then the world will be a lot worse off. So those are some things I love to do. Afterwards, go and enjoy your conversation. <laughs> Um, we want to thank uh, and show me the connection to politics that I was wondering about. I didn't know that there was such connection. Um, let's take a minute until 10 after 2. There's coffee outside. Um, and then we'll come back to the table. We can uh, uh, have some of these uh, really interesting questions and in the end, take some QA. Thank you. Very, very, very